five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts. Welcome back to another episode with an exceptional guest. Greg Autry has won many leadership hats in the space sector. He's currently the clinical professor and director of the Space Leadership Policy and Business Program at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at ASU. He was also a presidential nominee for CFO at NASA and continues to hold roles at the agency. He was also chair of the FAA's ComStack Safety Working Group. So we have a lot to talk about and do ranging from space entrepreneurship over space safety to geopolitics in space. I think you'll really enjoy this one. I did. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by NanoAvionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us to help expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hey, space enthusiasts. Welcome back to another episode of the Space Business Podcast. Um, my guest today, is, I've been having to uh, one for a long time on this podcast. It's uh, Greg Autry. And Greg, welcome to the podcast. And you are, like me, I guess, wearing quite a few different hats in the space sector and have worn even more in the past. Do you mind just giving us the whirlwind tour of your bio, please? <laughs> wow. Well, thank you, Raphael, for having me. Uh, pleased to be here on your show. Um, real quick, I was a technology entrepreneur before I entered uh, the space industry. Uh, I had a video game company, a computer break and fix company, a company that did computer network security and application development in the healthcare industry. And uh, <clears throat> I then uh, began teaching part-time as an adjunct in 2002 at the University of California, Irvine, after completing my MBA. And I began to look around for an industry to write business cases case studies in and do business research in. And I get kind of excited about the commercial space industry. Uh, I've been a space fan since I was a child. Uh, I remember watching uh, Buzz and Neil Walk on the Moon when I was six. And so it was a good way for me to get back to that. And I saw there was a really eclectic and interesting group of people beginning to found commercial space startups that look like they might get traction. So it was that year SpaceX was founded. Blue Origin, I think, was founded in 2003. And then I was out in Mojave, California on the flight line when uh, Spaceship One uh, sent the first human into space on a commercial space vehicle in a suborbital flight there in uh, in June of 2004. Uh, and uh, on the runway there, Richard Branson uh, founded Virgin Galactic uh, uh, right there, said he'd buy five of these vehicles. And then I really saw this industry taking off. So that's how I kind of got started in the industry. I'll be honest, at the time, my fellow business professors just laughed and said, the space business is not an appropriate place for, uh, for studying entrepreneurship because it's only about the government and really big companies, you know, that you've got this military industrial complex, we call it here in the US. And of course, in the Soviet Union and China, you have these state owned enterprises. And, and, and in Europe, the companies are so meshed in with the, the state that uh, that it's hard to disambiguate them. So you can't study entrepreneurship. And I like I met this guy named Elon Musk. And I, I think you're going to mm. hear from him someday. And, uh, you know, fast forward, uh, became a really exciting industry. Uh, in 2016, by that time, I think it was widely regarded as probably the most informed and connected uh, management scholar in, in the, uh, the commercial space uh, industry. 
and I received an appointment uh, to join the transition team at NASA. Uh, for those that don't know, the transition team is a group of people who are appointed by a, an elected president in November of uh, the year before they take office. So right as soon as they're elected, uh, they appoint a transition team and they don't take office until January 20th. This team is supposed to go into every agency and decide what to do uh, in that agency. And uh, I was pleased to be included on the NASA team, which uh, made decisions about NASA. Uh, and we can talk more about that and other space-related things. Uh, then I was appointed to be the White House liaison uh, at NASA, representing uh, the connection between the White House and, and NASA. <clears throat> and uh, later I was nominated to be the uh, chief financial officer at NASA, uh, but political dysfunction in the U.S. prevented the U.S. Senate from ever holding a confirmation vote on uh, on that presidential uh, nomination. Also served at FAA, the uh, regulatory agency for uh, air travel in the United States, who uh, has an office called the Office of Space Transportation, Commercial Space Transportation. And I served on a uh, committee there that advised the Secretary of Transportation about uh, the rules, regulation, and how to promote and facilitate the commercial space industry. Uh, I've taught at uh, University of California, University of Southern California, and now at Arizona State University's Thunderbird School of Global Management, where I'm super excited to be leading the world's first uh, management uh, graduate degree program in uh, in space. Perfect. So there's going to be a lot to unpack there, and we're going to try you know, we have the time to talk about a few, like just a few of your roles, but I just, I just want to pick up, um, I just want to pick up on one sentence you mentioned there. It's, uh, I think uh, you said when you first started or soon after, the perception was that the space sector was not an appropriate place for entrepreneurs at that time because it was substantially government dependent. There's some people yeah. who would argue today in 2023 and sort of like, you know, sort of like perfect hindsight and some of the, you know, outcomes of the uh, spec mergers and so forth, that that actually still is the case. What would you respond to them? If we looked back at the internet in 2000 or 2001, when the dot-com bubble burst, we would have seen a lot of startups riding on top of a basic technology, the internet developed by the US government uh, as the ARPANET, um, rise and then collapse. And a lot of them went out of business, right? And there were people at that time saying, oh, the internet was a foolish investment and, uh, and you know it's not really a thing. People are not gonna order things by clicking with a mouse <clears throat> and even Amazon was not profitable for, for years and years and years after that. Uh, fast forward to the space uh, industry, same thing. You've got a lot of companies that start up. Some of them crash and burn. Some of them will go bankrupt. Some of them will be acquired. Uh, you saw this going back to the auto industry in the 1920s. There were all sorts of brands of cars uh, that, that you know existed in Europe and the United States that <laughs> do not exist anymore. We've never heard of it. Again, those companies went bankrupt. Some of them were acquired. The important thing is that this is just a natural cycle in every entrepreneurial industry. And uh, I am not at all worried about it in the space industry. And the thing to realize is that the, the Human beings don't go away. They just end up working for different companies. The people that worked at Pets.com back in, in 2000 or, uh, you know, the Johnson Motor Company that no longer exists went across the street and they, they continued to do their work and the machinery was was purchased and reallocated. So if you look at, you know, Virgin Orbit, Strato Launch purchased their airplane, other people are purchasing their rocket technology and the machinery and stuff will continue to get done just under different names. And I suppose so. you're kind of like me believing that we may be in the similar phase with the internet that, you know, we had like a mini bubble, but it's like actually a really interesting time now, both for entrepreneurs and investors, which means then if we want to build the space industry, we need a lot of potential entrepreneurs and investors and, and, and employees and other people who join the sector. So talking about what you're doing at the Thunderbird School right now, is that is that one of the reasons that you founded, that you helped to develop the program to you know, develop the space economy and get more people in yeah. there. Because fi finance and management turns out to be super important. Uh, and a lot of people only look at technology industries as as technologies. And that that's a huge mistake. So if you see the Internet companies that failed, a lot of them had great technologies or even strong marketing teams, but they were not well managed. Right. The ones that failed. And even on the government side, when I worked on the NASA transition team, we dug deep into the books, you know, at NASA, looking at the, uh, the accounts and trying to decide which programs uh, to keep, which programs uh, 
you know, should be terminated. And we look at a program like James Webb Space Telescope, right? It was an almost an order of magnitude over its original planned budget and years behind schedule. And there were many other programs like that, big and small. And when you looked at them, it usually wasn't necessarily the technology that was the problem. It was very often the management. And we discovered that both in the private sector and, you know, uh, in government agencies that engineers and scientists would be pushed up into management roles, but they'd have no education in accounting or finance or leadership or the tools that were required uh, to run a large group of people with a large budget. So I really felt there was a need for this. And you could send people off to get a an MBA, but it's a whole lot better to do it in the space context. So in our program, we bring in myself, my colleague Zahir Ali, who uh, is a physicist who worked on the SOFIA program and has managed uh, several different uh, uh, projects in the in the space world. We've got Kevin O'Connell, who was actually the director of the Office of Space Commerce. Our finance class is taught by the current deputy uh, CFO at NASA, Steve Shen. Uh, so anyway, a great group of uh, space professionals, uh, Dr. Namatra Goswami, who's a geopolitical space expert. Uh, and I thought bringing that sort of group of people together to teach future space leaders was uh, a good way to help uh, head off uh, uh, failures and uh, and help the industry, uh, uh, you know, get through uh, what I think is just a natural correction process. And I don't think this would have happened uh, this year um, if it wasn't for just the general downturn in the global economy, the shakeup in the supply chain, which really hurt the space industry from COVID and the rise in interest rates, uh, uh, you know, kind of created by the U.S.'s attempt to control inflation. This all really hurt the investment environment uh, badly. Yeah. So before we delve into the, the Thunderbird program a little bit more, the curriculum and so forth. Let me just interject, <clears throat> excuse me, one question, because you were mentioning the, the importance of management at an organization like NASA as well. And so you were appointed the, um, or you were suggested by the president, or I guess appointed by the president to be the chief financial mm -hmm. officer. I know you were never confirmed. Just out of curiosity, what does a NASA CFO do? Because in the private sector, yeah. I have a pretty good idea what a, what a CFO yeah. does. Just so wondering how. <laughs> good question. So NASA has a $26 billion budget. Uh, the office of the CFO has over 2,000 uh, employees in it, uh, mm. spread across the country uh, at uh, at 10 NASA centers and other locations, uh, managing all sorts of projects and making sure that in the case of NASA, that what they do and what they spend their money on is in uh, compliance with the congressional uh, appropriations and with allocations from uh, from the agency. And they work with the White House's Office of Management and Budget, which is part of the executive branch of the government, charged with making sure that agencies are actually spending the way their money the way that uh, the Congress intended. Um, and so that's the job of, of the CFO. It's not as much about revenue as it might be in a private company. In a private company, you're trying to increase your uh, your income as well as manage your costs. In the government, usually you're mostly focused on, on managing your costs and then being able to prove to auditors. The United States government has uh, auditors that come in from the general accounting office uh, and uh, sometimes Congress and elsewhere. Where where did we spend the money? And then arguing, you know, this, this particular uh, program, James Webb Space Telescope, is over budget. Uh, this is why. And making projections, uh, you know, about how how you think you can manage that uh, in the future. So those are the sort of things that the CFO's office does at NASA. Yeah, and I have to you. say they've done a great job. Of, uh, there are rankings of the quality of the financial reporting that agencies do. And, and NASA has continually uh, uh, been at the lead of the, the U.S. federal government in, in managing that. So when, when I say some programs are over budget, frankly, NASA does a really good job compared to many other agencies. Great. Close brackets on the on the NASA CFO and coming back to the, the Thunderbird Executive uh, Master's Program. Actually, what's the, pre the precise name? It's the Executive Master's in, I think, Space global, Leadership. The Executive Master's in Global Management, uh, Space Leadership Policy and Business. That's quite a mouthful. So... Thunderbird's a global school, which is really an important point. Uh, we were founded in 1946 by United States Army Air Corps officers who believed that the U.S. was a little too insular from a business perspective and that the real future of the 20th century was going to be about trade with uh, Asia and Europe uh, while they rebuilt after the war and that we needed a school dedicated to uh, uh, engaging uh, globally. And so it always has had that uh, global connection, which I love, and I've been traveling around the world uh, the last couple years uh, promoting the program and our, our students uh, 
come from all over. So that that's part of our DNA is to, to not just be about the United States, but to be global. And so how does that then translate into the curriculum? Like what kind of stuff do people learn in the program? Sure. So as I mentioned, we're kind of doing what you might call an MBA, but we're doing it with a very global perspective. So there are specific classes and understanding the cultural implications of, of, of cross-border business, for instance. Uh, and uh, we often, uh, like I said, bring students in from around the world, which isn't that unusual now, actually. 1946, it kind of was. And we have offices around the world where uh, where we send students uh, out to and we we do uh, programs around the world. So I was in uh, Riyadh, for instance, uh, last August doing a program for the Saudi Space Commission out there. And uh, we have offices in uh, Dubai, Mumbai, Geneva, uh, London, Tokyo, Seoul. Uh, um, I can't keep up, but uh, about 20 of them uh, around the world. And who would you, how would you characterize the, the target universe? Like what What, what kind of students are you trying to attract and then sort of um, how successful have you been in that? Okay. So our goal is executive students, first of all. Uh, so, you know, there's a pyramid of talent. And at the beginning, I always tell my entrepreneurs, focus on the top, uh, the top margin of the business. And, and we've done that here. There's a lot of reasons to do that. One of the reasons is you can make more of a difference and establish a brand reputation better at the top than at the bottom, right? So if you start out as Volkswagen, it's a lot harder to climb up than if you start out as BMW and you release a less expensive car. Uh, 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 and you can focus on a smaller number of students and do a really, really good job or a smaller production of, of what a product you're making. So that, that's our goal. Start at the top. And eventually we'd like to have a regular master's degree program and a, uh, a, an undergrad program. But our goal right now is to exec, uh, executives who can uh, become leaders very quickly in, in, in the industry. So we'd already had people coming in who were C-suite executives, venture capitalists, um, moderately successful uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we had a captain in the Space Force, a retired Air Force colonel and a uh, brigadier general in the, uh, the U.S. Air Force as well. So our goal is, is people who are already uh, pretty successfully employed who kind of want to move up to the next level. I think you'll see these people making a difference. And in fact, if you go on LinkedIn, you'll, you'll see them talking to the United Nations yesterday and you'll see them, uh, um, you know, addressing space conferences uh, uh, across the United States and around the world or, or taking senior positions uh, at companies. And how do you find your students? Is that mostly inbound? Because I mean, there's this, I think at least in my perception is ongoing, you know, stereotype about that the general public outside of our space bubble, right? Holds about the space sector that well, it's only for rocket scientists and like, um, there's no place for me, which is obviously not true because a qualified business person, at least in my view, we need them in the space sector. Are you guys also going out and trying to, to market this actively? Yeah, we, we have to, because the industry is growing so quickly that if we don't bring in leaders from outside the sector, then all All we do is churn. Yeah. And, and when I talk to people at, at uh, you know, companies I respect, uh, whether that's Virgin or Redwire or, uh, you know, Boeing, I, I hear, you know, we're hiring these people from over there and they're hiring from us and it's, it, it's just a churn and, and there's not mm -hmm. enough talent we need to bring in external talent. So there's a lot of qualified people in the technology sector who are suddenly realizing space is the next hot place to be. And, and like myself, gee, that's always what I want to do. So, you know, I went into software just like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk did, even though we all wanted really uh, thought we wanted to be astronauts or something when we were young, right? But we found a way to get into the space sector without being a test pilot or, uh, you know, without being an, uh, 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 an aerospace engineer. So there, there's definitely need for that. And, you know, I, I'll plug other people's programs too. There, there's need for space policy people. Uh, Scott Pace's program at GW does a great job there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's need for space lawyers. And mm -hmm. you've got Michelle Hanlon's program uh, uh, at Old Miss, uh, the uh, Center for Space Law. So there's a lot of uh, Uh, opportunities for people across the uh, talent spectrum in space. And we're trying to fill that uh, space leadership niche. And so how, how many cohorts have you had? Just one. So the first one uh, graduated in December of uh, the last year. And the next one starts uh, at the very end of August, beginning of September of this year. And there's still a little bit of time to get in. Um, if you can post the uh, the URL uh, for Thunderbird. That'd be great. Or if you anybody Googles Thunderbird School of Global Management Space, you'll find it uh, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, we start in September. It's a one year program. It's designed for busy professionals. So uh, we don't expect you to quit your job. We understand you're busy. Uh, it is three five day uh, residentials, one in Los Angeles where kind of the 
commercial space sector boom started and there's still a lot of great companies there. We go visit companies in that area like SpaceX, Rocket Lab, uh, Relativity Space, perhaps. And then in Florida, we do one week at the Kennedy Space Center. We actually teach it in the Kennedy Space Center visitor complex uh, and uh, go out and visit all the companies around Cape Canaveral, uh, the United States Space Force uh, and, and the NASA facilities. And then one week in Washington, D.C. Uh, in between, there are eight weekends in person at our global headquarters in Phoenix and eight weekends online. OK, and we'll we'll definitely post the link to the program in the in the episode notes so listeners can find it there. So after having done one cohort, any sort of you know, interesting conclusions, uh, feedback. I don't know, your students mentioned sort of what they found particularly useful. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, what I'm most proud of is when I go to a space conference these days, I'm almost always seeing a group of people saying something like, the space industry isn't diverse enough. And, you know, that's a, a big issue politically and socially in the United States right now. And their solution for that is we need to go into the secondary schools or maybe even the primary schools and talk to young people about space and make sure that, you know, young women of color or whatever are enthused about space. And, you know, that's great. And that will solve this problem uh, long after I'm dead, uh, because it's going to take a long while for these people to, to work through their career path to, to become qualified leaders. So what can we do about that? And what we've done is we brought in people from other industries that had that diversity, but weren't in the space industry. And, and we've given them both a management education and a deep, deep connection into the space industry. So I'm super proud out of that. Uh, I'm super pleased with uh, the way the space community supported our program. I mean, the guest speakers we've had, uh, we've had General Charlie Bolden, uh, you know, Obama's uh, NASA administrator. Um, we've had uh, 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 Jim Bridenstein uh, at one of our uh, events in Florida, Scott Pace a couple of times. In fact, we had uh, Charlie Bolden and Scott Pace talking to our, our small group of 22 students at the same time for like a couple hours. Can you imagine having the top Obama and top Trump space officials in the room with 22 students uh, kind of riffing off each other, right? And, and agreeing with most things, but, you know, occasionally disagreeing. Uh, Tori Bruno, the CEO of United Launch Alliance, uh, just a, a whole host of, of, of really talented space people have stepped up and, and given our time. Um, the students have been amazing. Uh, they've been a really tight and cohesive entity, and uh, we're still all constantly in, in communication, which is what I wanted. They've been helping each other, um, you know, in their career paths and uh, and in advice, and, and they're already interacting with the students from the second cohort uh, and helping uh, them plan for, uh, for their experience at Thunderbird. So I'm super excited about how that's gone. Terrific. Let's let's also make sure we talk about some of your other interesting roles in the space sector. And um, one thing I want to pick up of uh, on is your another role you have at NASA, which is um, I think chairing a committee at something called NASA Inspar. Mm -hmm. So the in-space production applications yeah. uh, is a really great program. Uh, it's a small program that NASA runs that helps allocate some funds. Um, and more importantly, uh, transportation to and from the space station and, and uh, as needed, sometimes astronaut time on the space station for experiments uh, in uh, high TRL manufacturing uh, processes. So these are manufacturing uh, solutions that usually fit in a rack, right, and are ready to make materials, uh, bioengineered uh, uh, products and uh, and uh, uh, crystalline products uh, that benefit from being in zero G. Uh, and uh, I help look at the business cases. I'm really excited about that because uh, it's really important that the business cases close uh, along with the, uh, um, the engineering and the science behind these programs. And I also want to say CASIS and uh, ISS and NL, ISS National Laboratory folks, uh, you know, manage uh, a, a great portion of that. And we work in concert with uh, with them on the uh, the selection of uh, of these awards. And and it's, it's very serendipitous. I'm, I'm actually having this conversation with you uh, from from Winston-Salem in North Carolina, where I'm attending something called the Global Stem Cell uh, Summit. And we'll have an entire morning tomorrow just on um, stem cell research and production use cases wow. in, in space. So it'll be very interesting. And for those that don't know, you know, one of the exciting things is that when you want to grow a culture of cells on the earth, you usually put them in a Petri dish and you get a, a, a two dimensional Cell Something very flat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's hard for the cells to grow naturally in the three dimensional way they, they do inside of an organism. 
Uh, it happens that in space <clears throat> that you can, in fact, let the cells grow three dimensionally and they grow orders of magnitude faster than they would in the two dimensional format. So if you want to take somebody's stem cells and, for instance, try to grow a, a liver or a, a, an organoid, a portion of an, an organ to do some testing on, uh, again, you get a liver pancake on Earth. But in space, you can start growing a whole uh organ in a much more timely manner and it can vascularize it can get the uh arteries and veins that it needs going through the, the organ so that you can support uh, its uh its function as, as an organ so there's hope that someday you know when you need an organ transplant instead of hoping somebody's going to die that's compatible with you uh <clears throat> that instead they'll take some of your blood they'll they'll differentiate those puriparent uh stem cells uh into deliver kidney cells, grow you an organ uh, in space and, and bring it back down. And, and you won't have to spend your whole life receiving treatment uh, to suppress your immune system, which is trying to, uh, to attack that, uh, that donor organ because it'll be your DNA. Yeah, no, no risk uh, ever of what we call host versus graft disease. So that's yes. a really interesting use case. And of course, close to my heart, some listeners may know I just helped co-found a company which is doing exactly this. <laughs> In Switzerland, but that's only one example of an interesting micrographic use cases. As you alluded to, Greg, there is a number of substantially material science and then biotech mm -hmm. use cases. How does Inspire choose them? Like, do you have regular calls where you define what you want people to send you, or can people just send you? Random yeah, project. Well, like all NASA grant programs, there's a very clear criteria for uh, how that process works. And, um, and NASA tries to keep it very transparent um, about how that works. But people submit, uh, you know, essentially white papers <clears throat> on these products, 15 page documents that include engineering plans uh, and analysis of uh of the cost uh, in the team, of course, that they're going to apply to this, as well as the business case in this case, because NASA wants to see uh, companies actually emerge from this that, that are going to deliver the product to the public. And, and uh, this isn't designed to uh, to be just another one of these science experiment things. This is designed to be what is actually ready to uh, to help move the commercial space industry forward because NASA is aware that we're going to have, uh, you know, at least a couple, perhaps more commercial space stations very soon. And, and they need to have a business model uh, that works. And uh, this is part of, of getting to that point and using the ISS National Laboratory's uh, you know, amazing capabilities to uh, uh, to test the uh, the, the close to uh, the close to market ready products. Yeah, exactly. And like you're mentioning right now, we're basically all using the ISS, but yeah, it's, as you're alluding to in the near future, I mean, there's now the, the, the NASA CLD program, right? The commercial Leo destinations. There is, um, you know, there are several space station projects are in the process. There's a number of space stations, which are outside of CLD you know, companies like VAST and Gravitics and, you know, sort of putting on my head as a space venture capitalist, I can think of probably something like by now two dozen or so companies wanting to build uh, commercial free flyers where where do you see the sort of the in-space manufacturing um subsector going what's your vision there i'm very excited about it uh but like every new industry it's it turns out it's going to be harder than we think and we're going to go through that same cycle we just discussed with uh with mm. space companies uh not everybody's going to succeed but uh i think we'll see uh, a couple of what you call killer apps uh, solutions that that just make sense and when you think, for instance, you know, we discussed those organs, people are going to think, well, that's crazy expensive to, to do that. And only, you know, the wealthiest people will be able to benefit. And maybe at the very first that that might be true. Uh, but in so many industries, things have been really expensive at first. And once you get them to scale, you're able to uh, to drop that price down very, very quickly. And when you consider the fact that you're going to maybe pay a little bit more for an organ to do the transplant, um, the fact that you don't have to keep those people alive for years and years and years on dialysis or whatever other treatments while they're waiting for somebody to die and donate an organ, and then you don't have to keep them under uh, medication and under treatment and the complications you mentioned for years and years and years after, there, there's there's actually a pretty good uh, cost argument. And on the material side, uh, we have seen a, a high-end fiber optic cable called ZBLAN that when manufactured manufactured uh, in, in space appears to be commercially viable, uh, even with the cost associated with that. Um, there are chemicals you just can't make anywhere else except in space because, you know, anytime you go to a pharmaceutical factory, uh, you see these big 
mixing machines and they're mixing because the heavy molecules fall to the bottom of the vat, right? You've got to keep mixing in space. You get, uh, you know, a blob of, of chemicals that will actually uh, uh, mix perfectly, great metal alloys and things that just can't be done anywhere else. So some of these things are close to invaluable. Anyway, I think that the in-space manufacturing will get there. And then the next step, of course, is ISAM, where you're actually making things in space for space and mm. begin to you know, perhaps build structures and stuff. Uh, I think that's a little farther off, but I'm also excited about that. I've been working with Professor A.J. Mashal at Purdue uh, on space manufacturing, uh, and uh, he's he's uh, been a real leader in putting together uh, uh, events and workshops on, on that topic. And uh, I think people are going to be amazed what they see in the next decade uh, coming from space that will show up in their own home someday. Yeah, and I'm, of course, I'm naturally totally sold on that vision. I'm, I'm just going to sort of add my uh, a couple of things to to specific things you said on um, the point you mentioned that you know, people might think sort of the, the organs from space might be super expensive. But yeah, you, like you already said, like people have to make this calculation really carefully. Right. And actually, one thing I learned today is that. I mean, a transplanted organs are really expensive too. usually hundreds of thousands of dollars, donor organs, that is right. And then donor organs, since they're not your own organs, and there's this risk of your body rejecting it, apparently the monthly cost of the medication to ensure that your body doesn't reject it is up to $30,000 a month. So we have to make these calculations very, very carefully. Yeah. And that and then, doesn't even count the fact that people get sick and sometimes yeah. need a second transplant yes. or, or, or they die in a very expensive way uh, from the rejection. And then among the use cases you mentioned, um, uh, so an, another one that came to my mind is, uh, which I think is really interesting, is um, some people are working on producing advanced types of semiconductors in microgravity, which we can do on Earth because we can bind the materials on Earth. And of course, that even has strategic importance. Yeah, exactly. So that's I'm actually attending a conference at Purdue next month with uh, Professor Michal that I mentioned specifically on the semiconductor. <clears throat> so a lot of major global semiconductor companies are really interested in the fact that you can get a much smoother distribution of atoms and therefore make much smaller features. Because right now Moore's law is constrained by uh, you know how fine of a uh, a, a uh, circuit that you can make on a, a on a chip, and we're kind of reaching the the level that we can do here on Earth, but it looks like we can do a little bit better uh, in zero G because we get a much better distribution of materials on, on the wafer. Terrific. So that's your role at Inspar. Super exciting. Let's move move on. Um, you've also been a member at something called Comstack, FAA, FAA Comstack. What, what is Comstack? Yeah. So one of the things I think is interesting about the United States government that people don't know is that all of the agencies uh, that are out there have advisory boards composed of people from the industry or from the public who help guide uh, the uh, agency in making uh, uh, decisions um, on rules and regulations and other activities they conduct. So the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, which was set up back in the 1980s uh, during the Reagan administration, uh, is tasked with uh, regulating the uh, launch and reentry of commercial spacecraft, as well as facilitating and promoting the industry itself. <clears throat> and so how do you do both of those things effectively? Uh, well, you don't just sit in a room as government folks and, and make up the rules. So the Comstack is composed primarily of, uh, of representatives from industry organizations, uh, and they issue reports to the FAA, and the FAA will mandate and ask them, we want you to report back to us on these specific items. Uh, I was excited to be one of the few people who wasn't actually working for a particular company, but was kind of embedded and very connected in the industry, and I thought I brought a unique perspective there. I had the honor to serve as the chair of the safety working group, and our job was to you know, to look at things like, should it become necessary for the FAA to regulate human spaceflight safety? How would that be done? And this might surprise people to find out that the FAA has no rules currently in place to protect the occupants of a uh, commercial spaceflight. Uh, they are charged with ensuring that the, the public is protected from rocket launches and reentries. These are the people not involved in the flight, making sure that if you take off from uh, Spaceport America in New Mexico, that you don't land in Albuquerque, or if you take 
take off from Kennedy Space Center, you don't land, uh, you know, in Orlando. And they do a great job of that, making sure that we don't accidentally uh, interact with a, a commercial <clears throat> airline flight or a, or a ship at sea. Uh, there's never been an incident where an American uh, uh, <clears throat> space launch uh, caused any injury to anybody. And we're, you know, super proud of that, particularly given the number of launches that are occurring now. <clears throat> so that's good. But what there isn't is any rule saying space tourism on a particular vehicle is going to be certified as safe by the U.S. government. The government doesn't do that. Uh, they don't do it because the 2005 Commercial Space Launch uh, Act Amendment specifically prohibits them from doing that because the Congress was wise enough to see that we don't understand this industry well enough to regulate it. And having people that don't understand it because we haven't really done it create rules would be like 1910 creating regulations about airplanes. We probably would have had rules about what kind of cloth and what kind of wood you were allowed to use to construct an airplane. And once you lock those things into place, you actually retard the development of the industry economically, and you probably don't allow it to become more safe. So we need this <clears throat> learning period in order to become more safe. So right now, those rules don't exist, but our team would look and work with industry and with other organizations like the uh, A A S E A S T M. Uh, and talk to them about what would be best practices for that so that FAA can can be prepared should they be required to produce regulations. And, and as you mentioned, when we were chatting before we started recording that that actually there's a moratorium right now, basically saying that there are like, like you mentioned, there are no rules for commercial space flight participants, but that's actually mm -hmm. expiring. Yeah, right now we're operating on under what you would call an informed consent regime. It's important that the companies explain to the spaceflight participants to the best of their knowledge what the risks are. But just like if you or I go snowboarding uh, or scuba diving and a lot of other extreme sports, you sign off a piece of paper that says, I understand this is an inherently dangerous activity and I'm not holding the operator uh, liable for that. And the government does not regulate these things. No inspectors come in uh, and look at, uh, at your skis and make sure that they're safe for your scuba equipment. These are industries that regulate themselves. So that's where we are now. Um, that moratorium is going to expire in October if Congress doesn't extend it. They have extended it in the past. Uh, I anticipate they might, but they're unfortunately it's been super busy in the United States with a lot of other budget issues and such. So it's been not something they've been focused on. If they don't, the FAA will, will need to, to set rules. Uh, and uh, I don't think we're ready for that yet. I would suggest that instead of extending it for X number of years, they extend it to we have so many uh, flights, like perhaps one uh, one hundredth of one percent of the airline flights in the country, or maybe you know twenty five hundred passengers a year. Because I don't think it's in the public interest to protect a very small group of very wealthy people who are are doing something they know is super dangerous. So we don't need a whole government bureaucracy uh, uh, coming down and in, in, in protecting a couple dozen people taking uh, joy rides uh, uh, in space every year. I don't think that's a good use of the public's time, but. I believe 10 years from now, we'll see thousands of people traveling in space every year, and, and it will probably know enough about that process that it will make sense uh, to have a regulatory re uh, regime in place. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you there. I think it would probably just stifle innovation, and then it may also lead to regulatory arbitrage, just companies locating to other jurisdictions where... Absolutely. And it's harder for, new, for startups to enter industries that have complex regulation because from day one, they have to hire lawyers and uh, uh, people uh, just to deal with the government. And uh, and that slows everything down. And, and it's like you say, it's like informed consent. People know this is dangerous. It's kind of in the same way that, you know, people know climbing Everest is dangerous, <laughs> but they're doing it every year. And then almost every year, some people die. Oh, yeah. And you know, that's my, my favorite analogy, you know, Raphael, people would say to me, oh, as soon as there's an accident, this industry will, will end. And I'm like, no, it won't, because like a dozen people will die on Everest in one year. And when you climb up there, you actually walk past the bodies of the yep. dead people they pushed aside. Right. Uh, and there are people who have lost like limbs from frostbite and they go up again the next year. <laughs> so now people understand what they're doing and they're doing it because. Because it's hard uh, to kind of paraphrase uh, President Kennedy. They're not doing it because it's safe and easy. 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm certainly with you. I'm, as, a, as a space tourism investor, I hope that certainly people will understand that when there is a fatal accident, which inevitably probably unfortunately will happen, <laughs> nobody's going to be overzealous and just regulating yeah. the industry to death. I don't know how old you are, Raphael, but I'm old enough to remember back in the 1960s when I was a child, um, planes crashed all the time. I mean, literally every month there would be a hijacking or a, a, just a crash and hundreds of people died in, in airplane accidents all the time. It was a, unfortunately a fairly regular event. And if you go Google the you know aircraft deaths per year, you'll see that. We're used to it being like 100% safe now. It was, just, it was not like that. There was a machine in the airport I remember my grandmother would go to, and you could fill out uh, a, a form and put money in an envelope uh, and drop it in this box. And it was insurance in case you died on that flight that would pay off uh, your relatives. And I thought that was really morbid. I'm like, why do I care, Grandma? But she would do that. <laughs> Uh, Maybe we should bring that back for the initial <laughs> phase of space tourism. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, so Comstack, we remember Comstack also deals with um, things like space traffic management. Um, well, that's a good question, right? So in the United States, we have space situational awareness data from the United States Space Force, which uses ground-based radar and other systems to basically tell you where tens of thousands of objects in space are. That's good to know. Now, nobody is telling you, though, what to do about that, meaning as we launch new stuff, nobody says you have to put it here uh, and you have to do it at this time and you can't put it there. You know, this is how uh, air traffic management works. You've got this this government oversight uh, within each country and then they they work together globally to make sure that, that two planes aren't in the same location at the same time. We don't have that in space. Uh, and who should do that is a big question. The Trump administration, uh, we agreed the military shouldn't do that. And we wanted to move it to the Department of Commerce. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that that choice. Uh, but other people wanted to move it to the Department of Transportation, where the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation is. Uh, some people felt that, first of all, commerce is really good at working internationally uh, with other, other countries. Uh, and that's their job, whereas the military, not so good. And you've got it, whether you like it or not, you've got to work with China and Russia to a great degree on this topic. And having the military is probably not the best choice. The folks at FAA are really busy upgrading the air traffic control system to their next gen system. And frankly, perhaps that's taken longer than we would like. But right now, this is not settled. Uh, Congress has not stepped forward. The Biden administration has supported the Trump administration position that the Office of Space Commerce should handle this uh, this task. But there's still people in the United States Congress who want the uh, the Department of Transportation, FAA, to handle it. So it's not settled and nobody's doing it either in the U.S. or internationally. Uh, there's people, of course, who would like the U.N. to do it. And then there's people like me, I'll be honest, who respect the noble ideas behind the U.N., but are very realistic about how effective the U.N. is in actually getting things done uh, and think they would hold the industry back for decades while people talked and gave long winded speeches about space traffic management. So I'd rather that the United States step forward and set the standards the same way they did uh, in uh, air traffic management and then other countries can just copy that. I think that would be a, a good solution, but we're going to have to get there. Yeah, I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, uh, also like huge respect for the QN, but it may take decades. It seems like something like where the US, China and Russia should sort of hammer it out. But of course, sort of you mentioned a comparison with air traffic management, but of course that has developed over many decades and um, it was sort of fairly established now. And yeah, and again, it was now, probably... It was mostly a case the United States set the standards and everybody just copied it, much the way that the British set the standards for maritime uh, uh, behavior and the rest of the world just, just adopted them. So if a Russian pilot is landing in Shanghai, he talks to the air traffic controllers in English using rules that were created in the United States. And I'm sure that that grates on the Chinese, but it works, right? And uh, it got done. Are you optimistic that in the current geopolitical environment, we could hammer something out that involves the Russians and the Chinese, or I guess no. it may just work through like rational <laughs> self-interest because nobody has an interest in screwing up the orbital operating environment. It should, but you know, as soon as you go to a, a multilateral organization and try to negotiate something, each party will recognize advantages that they can create for themselves within the rules. 
And, you know, I'll be honest, I wrote a book called Death by China. Uh, I'm not a fan of their current government. I think they're really good at undermining multilateral organizations to advance their own needs. So if you look at what they did with the uh, the Olympic Committee, uh, somehow they seem to almost control the Olympic Committee. Anybody that thinks having a Winter Olympics in Beijing was a reasonable idea is, you know, diluted, I think. Uh, the w WTO, the WHO, they, they, they have subverted these organizations to... Uh, to their own interest. And I think that's problematic uh, from the U.S. perspective, at least. Uh, the Russians, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, and then it's just hard to get everybody to agree. Um, there are a lot of parties in the developing world who have this real concern with uh, equity, as they see it, uh, of space assets. And they're like, oh, all these orbits are going to get used up and we're not ready. So we should just leave those alone for 100 years while Africa and Latin America get their act together and, and uh, advance to the point where they can utilize space. Don't touch anything until then. Right. Uh, how do we fix all that? That that is just a, a, a quagmire of problems. And, and if we try to make that perfect, which I understand why people do, but if we try to make that perfect, nobody will benefit from space. We won't have these space organs. We won't have resources from the moon. We won't have uh, an exciting uh, new frontier. We won't offload the pressure from, from our precious blue planet uh, to protect our own environment uh, because we'll be too busy arguing about how to do it perfectly right. So. <laughs> There's all, I could go on for hours about that. Yeah, we could certainly just have a separate episode on that. But let's talk. So you mentioned the book uh, Death by China you wrote with, with Peter Navarro, um, mm -hmm. also previously of the Trump administration. And you wrote that over 10 years ago. It really seems very prescient. Um, right now. So I don't want to get into the general geopolitics of sort of strategic competition between the US and China on Earth. But I'm assuming you would agree that that also is or at least will be the major strategic competition in space. The US yeah, so it, and I, I and it's covered in a chapter in the, in the book. And I, I wish I was wrong about uh, the uh, the predictions in that book, but but they all essentially come true. But yeah, we talked about the moon in particular, and I, I think unfortunately for the Russians, they're no longer a serious player in space. Um, Dmitry Rogozin was a horrible uh, leader at, at Roscosmos and, and, and burnt up goodwill, chased away talented people uh, from that organization. And the country did not invest adequately in their space development. You know, they're, they're still flying the Soyuz, uh, uh, you know, from the 1970s, basically. And, and the one time it got a big upgrade to the TMA model, the U.S. government actually paid the Russians to do it. Uh, and then since the Ukraine war, nobody wants to play with them. So their whole commercial launch business and a lot of the other uh, things they used to do died. And and they haven't commercialized their business. They had a lot of great talent and some amazing technologies. And they didn't take those and, and develop a private sector because Putin didn't like that. And, and in fact, whenever you try to do international agreements with the Russians, they're not interested in, in SpaceX or Blue Origin or even a Russian equivalent of that succeeding. The Chinese at least say they want to have nominally commercial companies, but the Russians down. So I think they're off the table. It's really the U.S. versus China and, you know, the, the ideology there can't be squared. And uh, right now we're, we're conflicted over uh, trade, Taiwan, and a whole lot of issues on, on the ground. Uh, and, and yeah, that's going to carry into space, whether you like it or not. It's going to keep it interesting. Yeah. So, so I wonder, you know, I can put on sort of my, my, um, I can, I can use an, op an optimist perspective, you know, and, uh, and say this, in some way, it's like a race, like whether it's the race to maybe like the first lunar base, right, or something like that. And the optimist perspective would be, well, a race is competition, and that can actually sort of like, you know, um, make people more agile. I think Werner von Braun famously in an interview, he was asked, um, you know, what what if the US and the Soviets had cooperated um, to in, in the race to the moon? And Werner von Braun said, well, probably nobody would have gone to the moon. <laughs> I totally agree. So I have a slide that I use all the time that shows 1957 with Sputnik, you know, which is essentially a a basketball uh, that goes beep, beep, beep as it circles the earth and does nothing useful. And 1969, 13 years later, uh, you know, men walking on the moon and technology that even today still looks pretty amazing, right? People use that as like an icon of, of modern technology, even though it's, it's really old. 13 years. And then in 1974, uh, the United States and, and Russia did get together and then uh, the handshake in space and we're going to be cooperative. Imagine how much we'll achieve. Well, we were at an altitude of, uh, you know, a few hundred kilometers and a 51 degree inclination in a, a Soyuz. Uh, and, 
you, you fast forward 25 years and now you've got the beginning of the space station and you've got 51 degree inclination a few hundred kilometers up with a Soyuz. Uh, and 20 years after that, we're still 51 degree inclination a few hundred kilometers up with Soyuz. We really didn't accomplish hardly anything in the next 40 or 50 years compared to what we did in those 13 years of competition. So I, I welcome the Chinese competition. I hope they do really great in their civil space program. Uh, and I hope it makes Americans, uh, you know, and the Europeans and the Japanese and everybody else step up and say, you know, we want to show that we can do that too. So that that's a beautiful thing. So that's the optimist perspective. And then sort of the more, you know, the pessimist sort of concerns would be sort of, it is, it is of course competition. And then let's talk, you know, for example, um, the moon, um, you know, turns out, I think that some of the very valuable resources like the water eyes on the moon, they're actually concentrated in very small areas. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the moon is just one example. There's other strategic locations in space, like the Lagrange points is like, it, you could be sort of get into the scuffle with the Chinese over some of these strategic. Yeah, locations. I just read a, a, a two articles and I'm writing a series of four articles on a, a lunar orbital congestion, right? So it turns out that you've got not only the Lagrange points, but in low lunar orbit where you'd want to put communication and observation satellites and other services, uh, most of the orbits around the moon are unstable because of the gravity anomalies created by the mass concentration. So there's only a very few uh, inclinations for them that you can put satellites in, it's going to get crowded very quickly. And on the ground, there's the resources, the water ice and the asteroid cores that contain uh, metallic uh, elements that are accessible uh, are in specific areas. And the Outer Space Treaty, you know, a really interesting topic, in my opinion, is too ambiguous. And it's really unclear about how you could make any sort of exclusivity claim to an operation there. There's this vague language about, uh, you know, not not interference uh, in, in the idea that there could be an operational exclusion zone. But there's no rules for it and there's going to be arguments and mistakes. And yeah, I, I, I think we're entering a moment where there could be negative interactions that could escalate. Uh, this is one of the reasons the United States has founded the United States Space Force to to take our existing uh, space capabilities and, and uh, make them uh, leaner and better managed. And the Chinese certainly are uh, militarily focused and uh, with with similar organization. We could, we could keep talking about this geopolitical topic for hours, but <laughs> we don't have that much time left. So let me turn towards some, you know, general sort of like quick fire questions on, on the space uh -huh. sector, given all of your, you know, your extensive experience. So what do you think are our biggest to do's right now or challenges with regard to developing a thriving space economy? Well, um, I think one of the big things uh, for it to be sustainable uh, is the issue of uh, real property rights. And I mentioned the Outer Space Treaty. It's very ambiguous about commercial activities, and it specifically prohibits claims of sovereignty uh, on celestial bodies. And in my mind, that makes it very hard to develop the industries that we need, particularly on the moon. Um, if you're building a factory here on Earth uh, or or a mine, uh, you add value to this this piece of land by building a building on it uh, and you can sell uh, that property along with with the factory uh, or more important, you can collateralize it. You can borrow against it. So when people set up a car factory in the United States or Japan or Europe, they don't go get venture capitalists necessarily to fund that. They go to the bank because it's really easy to say, here's a piece of valuable real estate and and something we're building on it. And, and the bank can take that away if the company f fails to pay and sell it to somebody else. And right now we can't transfer that property. We can't collateralize it. We can't own it. And it's totally unclear if there should be a disagreement, like I mentioned, under whose law is that uh, disagreement going to be adjudicated and who could go in <clears throat> and enforce uh, uh, an adjudication uh, if, if there was was a decision. The UN could maybe make a decision on something, but white hats aren't going to go down and, and take some, I don't know, a US commercial operator and the Chinese government and pull them apart. And uh, uh, so I think that's a problem that that's important and uh, needs to exist. But in general, we need better financing. It can't always just be the government and venture capitalists. We've got to get to the point where banks are willing to make loans to orbital space stations and operators there and, and activities on the moon. Uh, and uh, I think getting that, that finance part is is so important and establishing this rule of law is is an important step to that totally agreed where do you see the where do you see the space sector in in 10 years sort of ideally and then realistically 
Yeah, ideally, I'd like to see, uh, like uh, Tori Bruno has uh, said, that there would be a thousand people living and working <laughs> in space, uh, mostly, I think, in uh, in Leo commercial uh, uh, stations and habitats, uh, probably focused on in-space manufacturing and on uh, um, space tourism. Uh, I'd like to see permanent uh, uh, human presence on the moon, which is part of the, the plan that we put together during the Trump administration and the Biden administration has reiterated. I would hope that would be an international presence, uh, similar to the space station with uh, European and, and Asian partners uh, engaged in there. Um, I don't think that's unrealistic, um, but uh, probably everything will take a little bit longer than we thought. Uh, so I suspect that might not happen until 2040, the way it, uh, the way things actually uh, tend to work out. But, you know, my, my fingers are crossed. I think we're definitely ready to see a couple of commercial space stations. I hope Starship is flying and, uh, and returning reliably by 2030. Uh, it won't be as fast as anybody uh, uh, would like it to be, just like everything else. Uh, I don't think that NASA is going to make their 2025 moon landing uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. But once you get Starship going, it's a orbital factory in itself. You can outfit everything you need on Earth. It can stay up for whatever period of time you need to manufacture stuff. And then the down mass. Down mass is so important and so ignored. Uh, right now, the only way we get, have to get stuff down reliably from the space station is in the uh, <coughs> the Dragon capsule. And, and that's not enough to run a manufacturing business. So we need to look at down mass. Um, but I'm, I think we're going to uh, to be there, uh, ho hopefully before uh, I die, I'll get to to see that future. I, I don't know that I'll get to participate personally, but I'd love to. But uh, uh, I, I think it'll be good. Yeah, we're getting into some, you know, potential sort of space business opportunities for entrepreneurs here, like you mentioned, the, the, the down mass. And that's certainly something also we're looking at very closely on the venture capital side. But you mentioned the moon there before. So in terms of like lunar businesses, I'm still wondering, and we haven't invested in any lunar businesses yet because we, I think there's many other people, we, we're still trying to figure out what the lunar killer app will be. <laughs> Do you have any view on that? Sure. Well, as you know, some people are focused on, on tritium, the isotope of helium that might enable uh, nuclear fusion to be both uh, less expensive and less radioactive. Um, and I'm excited about what's happening with fusion. You know, you look at the private side on fusion, it, it really feels like we might be there. I'm sure that there'll be another uh, uh, what we call hype curve there and, uh, and, and a valley of disappointment in fusion. But I think we're getting there in fusion. And so F, F. Uh, it turns out that helium-3 is useful in fusion, like we think that it is, and if it's available in lunar regolith, then that could be the killer app. The Chinese uh, lunar folks, the head of their, their moon program, the Chang'e program, has publicly stated that, you know, that's their goal and that they could, you know, run all of China on a couple of, uh, of payload deliveries of, of helium-3 a year, and uh, wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, otherwise, we know we've got rare earth elements and, and you've got uh, uh, metal asteroid core. But it's probably easier to get to those things uh, here on the Earth, despite the uh, the terrible uh, environmental impact. If you look at the way China right now, who has a, a global monopoly basically on rare earth elements, extracts them, it's it's an environmental nightmare. Uh, we used to do it in California. Actually, eighty percent of the rare earth elements in the world came from California uh, up till about two thousand, and it was done relatively cleanly. But anyway, you can do it under so much cheaper. So I don't know that that turns the dial. Water ice, well, you know, we don't need we don't need it here on Earth, but uh, you do need it in space and that'll help enable that orbital space economy because water is oxygen and water is hydrogen and, and that is uh, is uh, fuel and oxidizer plus it uh, is the stuff of life. Uh, so, you know, we'll see, but you're right. Uh, it's not totally clear what the what the lunar killer app uh, is there. Humans have an amazing way, though, of, uh, of finding killer apps in the short run. Space tourism is much bigger than I think people realize, and I think that is suborbital, orbital, and lunar. Uh, I think that if you bring back a kilogram of uh, of lunar material that can be made into trinkets and jewelry, uh, you could probably actually pay for your your two hundred million dollar space mission uh, to do that. Uh, I looked at some of those numbers: uh, orbital uh, in interment of human remains, whether that's just a, a few grams or or a whole person, which is like a kilogram or so. Um, you know, you could do that, uh, uh, cremated remains. Uh, and I think that people will pay to do that because it's it's interesting and different. And and the cost for the, the small amounts is is not out of line with with you might spend on a high end funeral anyway. So 
there, there are businesses there in the short run and in the long run, we, we've got to find out whether the, uh, the minerals and manufacturing, uh, you know, makes sense. Beyond, beyond the moon, what, if you had to start a space company right now, what, what excites you? <laughs> I probably wouldn't honestly put money in anything beyond the moon right now, I'll be honest, but, uh, I think the asteroids so not, are- not beyond the moon in sort of like distance, just like, um, in general terms, like any anything else in the space, well, space solar power certainly interests a lot of people. I think space solar power, you know, to the moon is interesting. Uh, space solar power to the Earth uh, promises to take solar power and make it something reliable. You know, the big problem we have now is it's a great idea, but it doesn't work at night when I want to charge my Tesla. So I've got solar panels and I have two Teslas, but I'm charging my Tesla off the grid. And frankly, they're burning natural gas or coal to charge my Tesla, right? Uh, how do you fix that? Well, solar panels in space uh, uh, work seven times more efficiently and, and they don't have nighttime or winter. And so, uh, you know, it's a great idea. So I, I that interests me. Uh, obviously, communications is a is a place to be, uh, and I think we're all going to see that our cell phones will actually talk to satellites. A lot of my friends in the United States think their cell phone talks to a satellite. I don't know why they have that idea, but but they will. Uh, and there are a couple companies out there like uh, Link and AST that uh, that are doing that now, and Starlink promises to uh, to go into that market. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting when we really do have completely persistent global uh, communications that is uh, is at a decent speed. All right. Fi- final questions. So uh, since you're a, an educator, one, one piece of advice for younger people looking at the space sector? Um, well, think outside the box and don't start a launch company. Um, <laughs> go and look at all the data being generated, right? So you, you're scanning, you're going to be able to scan the earth in a much higher cadence, close to real time uh, with remote sensing systems in multiple bandwidths. So you're going to have pictures, you're going to have uh, uh, ground penetrating radar. Uh, we know some of these applications now in agriculture. We know about uh, using ground penetrating or, or uh, uh, uh uh, aperture radar to uh, to take a look at oil uh, oil reserves and figure out what what what's in tanks uh, around the world. That's interesting. Being able to track every ship at sea uh, and know when it's going to arrive at port is actionable data. Trying to figure out what's really going on in the Chinese economy by seeing how many trucks and uh, and trains are moving around is interesting data. Um, looking at every house in my neighborhood to to see whose swimming pool needs to be cleaned is actually actionable data for 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 people who do work. So how to take all these images and and, and data and use AI in particular to sort them into actionable data for for real businesses on Earth, that 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 is a, a super sweet spot to be uh, in space manufacturing. We've talked about a lot, uh, but I would I would focus on that. The down mass problem uh, you talked about that. Um, so uh, think think far beyond launch. Uh, Eclis. Uh, I work with a really interesting startup in Paris called uh, Interstellar Lab, uh, Barbara Velvisi's company, uh, uh, and we started talking about. Eclis years ago, Barbara and I, and that's how she kind of started developing what she calls the biopod, uh, which has terrestrial applications for uh, creating a contained environment for growing high-end uh, plants for a variety of industries uh, and eventually in space. So think think outside the box. Uh, what, what can space do for companies that normally aren't space associated today? I agree. And I, I would like to add sort of bringing it full circle to where we started with the education and bringing people in from outside the space sector. So like the, you know, making satellite data useful for non-space sectors on Earth, we really need non-space people and, you know, who maybe then should go to Thunderbird and educate yourselves about the space aspect and then found really useful space startups that understand the intersection of you know how to make space data useful for, for non-space sectors. Final question, as always, is going to be on favorite science fiction. All right. These are probably my my three favorite. Uh, the Larry Niven Ringworld books. Yep. Uh, uh, Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. And, of course, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I'm proud to say I have autographed copies of all three of these on my shelf. Uh, but uh, I think you've got to have a little bit of fun uh, when, when you look at space. Um, you need to understand the social implications of, of space exploration, which I think is really what Stranger is about. And, uh, and uh, you know, just the magnificence of the ring world model, uh, I, I think... Uh, 
uh, imagines a future so far beyond uh, uh, what we're uh, we're looking at today that uh, you can see that uh, there's just a continual uh, and endless chain of, of technical progress uh, uh, that could be achieved. Perfectly agree. Love all of those three books. Greg, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing your experience and, and your knowledge. And maybe we'll do this again in a couple of years or so. Happy to do that. Thanks, Raphael. Well, that's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. If the podcast got you interested in learning more about the business opportunities in the space economy, Check out my new online course on space entrepreneurship on udemy.com. The link is in the episode description. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.